The NBA is going to have its finals, next media deal, and its draft in quick succession. We'll get into that with ESPN's Bobby Marks. Plus, bids are coming in for a Premier League team, two MLB stadiums brought huge crowds for non-MLB games, and the French Open wrapped up. It's Monday, June 10th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. Another bid has come in for Everton, the Premier League club that fended off relegation after points deductions of six and then two points for violating profit and sustainability rules. Now a group led by London-based businessman Vach Manukian has put in an all-equity bid of $508 million. They have competition from British businessmen and Everton fans, Andy Bell and George Downing. Americans John Texter and Dan Friedkin also want Everton, but there is a caveat there because Texter owns 45% of Crystal Palace, to finish 10th in the Premier League this year, he would have to offload that to buy Everton. More bidders are scoping out the scene, and we are likely a ways from a deal here. This one is extra complicated because Everton has flirted with relegation the last two seasons, and they are in the midst of building a new stadium, which will open for the 2025-26 season. That should grow the revenues once it is open, but it is weighing down their finances for now. Last month, they were offered a $190 million loan to help finance the stadium construction from a firm that specializes in distressed debt. Put all those nuances together, and that's how a 146-year-old Premier League club could be sold for something like half a billion dollars. A new stadium and a rise up the standings could quickly grow the team's value to something much larger. Two MLB stadiums were packed on Saturday for something other than MLB games. The Chicago Red Stars broke the NWSL attendance record with a game at Wrigley Field against Bay FC, which drew 35,038 fans. The Red Stars actually have the league's worst attendance this year and last year with an average under 4,000 fans prior to the Wrigley game. The Red Stars play their regular home games in Bridgeview, Illinois, a city to the southwest of Chicago, whose population of around 17,000 could not fill their 20,000 capacity stadium. As it happens, the only MLB park older than Wrigley also had something other than its usual programming. The Savannah Bananas brought Banana Ball to a sold-out Fenway Park. The Red Sox tend to have empty seats when they play. They have averaged 31,700 fans with a peak of 36,100 at their 37,800 capacity ballpark. The Bananas have already sold out their other MLB stadium games this summer in Washington, D.C. and Cleveland. And Carlos Alcaraz at 21 became the youngest man to win a Grand Slam title on each surface with his five-set win over Alexander Zverev in these fine French women. Zverev? I don't know. Zverev. Zverev, sorry. And Carlos Alcaraz at 21 became the youngest man to win a Grand Slam title on each surface with his five-set win over Alexander Zverev in the French Open final. On the women's side, Iga Swiatek continued her dominance of the event, winning her fourth title at Roland Garros in five years. They each take home $2.6 million for their victories. Joined now by front office insider at ESPN, Bobby Marks. Welcome, Bobby. Hi, how are you? Good to, good to join you. Yeah, great to have you back on. Um, so let's start with the NBA Finals because it's that time of the year. So we have a dominant team in the Celtics, you know, cruised through the regular season, continued at that same pace this year uh, in the playoffs, and a fifth seed in the Mavericks that showed they're as good as anyone. Um, how do you conceptualize this this matchup in terms of who these teams are, how they're built, how they got here? Yeah, two, two di different ways and how, um, you know, Boston and Dallas has been built that Boston is different than what we saw them in 2022 against, uh, against golden state. That was the last time they made the finals. I mean, certainly, you know, Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum are still there, but they kind of realized that that roster was not good enough. And then they go out and add Derek white and Kristaps Porzingis. And those two players have kind of been, um, kind of been the X factor here. Um, the Celtics, you know, I have not written their offseason article yet, but I think when I do, I'm going to write it, start it with, like, even if there was a third apron in the new CBA, it wouldn't matter to Boston here because how they're built, you know, certainly with with uh, with Jalen Brown, who signed a Supermax last year, and Jason Tatum, who's going to sign probably a Supermax this, this upcoming offseason here, um, they still have most of their draft picks. They still have the role players here, although it will start to get expensive and Dallas is, is interesting because, you know, two years ago, they're in the conference finals and only five players remain from that group here. Um, and instead of taking the approach we've seen in the past where whether it be Cleveland or Minnesota, where you're trading three first round picks for one player, 
they basically have taken three first round picks and traded for Kyrie Irving, PJ Washington, and Daniel Gafford. So instead of taking a big They've gone out and got three players um, for the cost of um, you know of three first round picks, uh, but both are built for sustainable success. Uh, I would not, you know, certainly the Western Conference is extremely challenging here, but when you have uh, Luca under contract and Kyrie's under contract for the next couple of years, and kind of your your role players are there and have gotten really nice lift out of uh, you know Derek Lively, their draft pick. Um, this is kind of not a one hit wonder for either team. Yeah, and it feels like. You know, we're sort of moving into this, you know, sort of post big three era, if we can say that kind of, I mean, the, you know, the second apron, the, you know, the new um, arrangement of like, you know, how, how much you get penalized for, you know, going over each line um, sort of meant to, you know, put something of a cap on these salaries. So you have to spread the talent around a little bit more. And I feel like, yeah, it's like, can you find a, you know, a Porzingis and, you know, other players like that who are really productive, but not you know you you can only have you know maybe two of these super max guys to um and, and then but you still have to fill out a super talented team if you obviously want to get to this level yeah i would i would say if if you really want to go to the big three um like phoenix did three max guys with with devin booker kevin durant and um and bradley beal you better love your roster <laughs> and you better have the resources and you better have the resources to go out and find talent around um, the challenge with that is when you don't have draft picks and you're stuck with the better, basically the veteran minimum makes it extremely, extremely challenging to go, to go do that. And, and basically what we're kind of going to see is probably players slotted. You know, Porzingis is making $30 million. You know, Derek White will probably get an extension, but he's not going to get a max contract unless it's from another team. You have your two big, your two big guys at the max and, and then everyone else is just kind of slotted based on how their role is. And do you think that basic formula is going to hold even as the salary cap, I mean, is going to go up, you know, 10% every year you know, for, for a very long time once that new media deal is signed? Do you think it's just going to be similar formula with everyone getting more money? I, I do. I mean, I, you know, it's funny when we, we uh, when Luca and um, Shea Gilders Alexander had earned M M the all NBA a couple weeks ago, we put out the graphic as far as what their next contract could be. And people went crazy because Shea could be earning $81 million in one year. I, it's a lot of money, but how the system is, it's no different than how the system was in 2012. I mean, it's still 25% or 30% or 30, you know, the supermax rule has changed a little bit, but it's still tied to the percentage of the salary cap. And when, the, when there's revenue coming in, that's why you're going to see a, a player making seventy million dollars, but at the end, it makes that that their salary cap is going to be a uh, hundred and eighty million dollars. So, although it's a lot of money in that player's pocket compared to maybe what Paul Pierce earned, you know, thirteen million dollars twenty years ago, how the system is set up, it's still the percentage has not increased. It's just the salaries have have continued to grow. Yeah, and. As long as we're on roster construction, the draft is coming, you know, just a couple of weeks after the, the finals wrap up. Um, and, you know, obviously last year, Wembenyama was the big story. Uh, this year we're getting, you know, maybe another three French players in the top 10, maybe another Croatian player in, you know, top 10, 12. Um, is this, is this going to be how things are going forward that, you know, you get, uh, you know, your, your Kentuckys and your Yukons, but you also get France, Croatia, Serbia, uh, the G League. Uh, it feels like the, the talent pool is, is coming from all, a lot of sources right now. Yeah, we've got another infusion of French players that are coming through, whether it be you know, Alex Saar or Zachary Richiche, who uh, many project to be the top two picks here. Um, you know, I think we could probably see seven or eight players total, maybe even more in the first round. Um, and then you, you look at what, you know, certainly the victor, impact last year at the, at the number one pick. I do think sometimes it comes in cycles a little bit. I think the, the, um, the freshman class that came in um, this past year wasn't as talent heavy. American players wasn't as talent heavy as next year when we have maybe Cooper Flag, who could be the number one pick who's going to Duke here. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's an interesting process. It's, it's, it's as wide open um, as I've seen in a long time, probably going back to 2013 when Anthony Bennett was the number one pick and a lot of people <laughs> had him on the back end of their, their big board here. Um, so it, there is no, I think that kind of makes it more interesting as far as there's no clear um, consensus. 
Um, I always say like these type of drafts separates who really has a good scouting department, like who really has a good scouting department. Certainly international scouts have to play a big role here, but I think you could find value, um, you know, certainly in the, in the lottery, but if you're picking at 21 or if you're at 17 where the Lakers are, or some of these teams that have you know, Miami at uh, 15, you can find a guy that can come in and help. Maybe not a franchise player, but I think you can, you can find a guy that can come in and help you right now. And this is questions probably just speaking to my ignorance on this particular topic. But when I think of basketball in Europe, it's like Croatia, Serbia, that's kind of like the hub. Um, so I'm a little surprised to, you know, have all this top 10, top tier talent uh, coming in from France. Uh, obviously, they've had great players before, but um did i just miss the fact that that france is actually the real basketball hub in europe <laughs> yeah it used to be and and still i think serbia has produced some high level players and certainly um you know we can talk about yeah you mentioned spain and um you know certainly luca um you know play you know you know greece with Giannis here but i think from the quality of young players that are coming through the system and yeah we saw we saw gobert um you know, Rudy Gobert, you know, 10 years ago, and that was kind of like the standalone here. But I think that has, it says something about their development program here as far as that they can continually produce four or five first rounders and consistently here that they've made a, uh, made a consensus um, w with that here. So I would say, yeah, I mean, certainly outside of the United States, you can make a, if you're France, you can make a really good argument that you're the, um, you know, the non-American basketball capital of the world of kind of developing young draft prospects. And I have to ask the Bronny question just because. Sure. Why not? <laughs> yeah, it's just a weird situation, right? Because if if he was not LeBron James Jr., um, then, you know, he might not get drafted or, you know, maybe he would he would play in college another year or go to the G League or something. You know, he's not someone we'd be talking about. But um, LeBron can opt out after the draft I think he's got three days and you know if if you're whatever the miami heat or you know some team who thinks they can bring lebron senior um um anyway what do you see happening here it's just such a unique thing yeah i, I think it's a little bit rich um using that a uh, first round pick on Bronny james I, I really do I, I i do think i do think there has to have a conver there has to be a conversation with teams um, who are maybe picking later in the first round um, and maybe do have cap space um, and, and don't have to go through the loopholes to have a conversation with Rich Paul and Clutch Sports is the, the, the agent for LeBron and, and Bronny here and saying like, hey, you know, if we do go this direction, what is LeBron's, you know, is he all in on LA? I, I do think it's, you kind of have to go through that, that due, due process here. I, I, I think, where Bronny comes into play um, is going to be really interesting. I, I do think he's draftable. Um, I think, you know, is he a first, if Phoenix takes him at 22, I think I would probably go on TV and crush Phoenix at 22, just based on, I think they can go out and find better needs as far as what they need for the bench here. And I think he's, I think for Bronny, um, it's, you know, certainly what happened at USC. It's such a, you know, the body of work, him being, you know, the illness, the, the cardiac incident um, didn't play much. Um, you know, really kind of played well in the, you know, the combine, shot the ball well, did, has done well in his individual workout, had, did not measure well. Um, you know, that's the other thing, did not measure well. Um, so it's, for him, it's like a two-year development process, right? Like, you're not going to see Bronny James in an NBA game. I don't think so. Um, but it would be time, you know, his commitment to playing in a G League. I know Rich Paul has come out and said he doesn't want to sign a QA contract, but you don't have to. You can be on an NBA um, second round uh, pick exception and, and go down in, in, into the G League here. So I do think it's it's a team that maybe has multiple picks um, that you're kind of maybe one, you know, one pick is for a guy that you're looking to kind of come on the scene and make an impact and the other maybe player is a developmental player here. So if he's at 55 where the Lakers are, I would be stunned <laughs> if they don't go in that direction here. Um, so I am kind of anticipating his name to be, uh, to be called when we get, uh, I guess it's the second night. So what that would be uh, June 27th. If, if you're drafting Bronny to get LeBron and that's, you know, and you, you would, if the LeBron wasn't part of the picture, you'd, you'd be picking someone else. Don't you kind of have to do some level of tampering here? I mean, you know, like tampering is kind of an open secret, right? Um, I think it would be, I think it would be, would be a headline would be uh, team draft non-Laker team drafts Bronny 
and then LeBron signs, goes back to the Lakers, but on a two-year contract with a player option for next summer again. And that basically kind of like, oh, okay, you know, maybe he will be, maybe he will join his son next, you know, the summer of 2025 here. So yeah, I think, I think you have to, um, you know, I, you know, do as I say. I mean, it happens a lot. Is, is kind of just, hey, put a feeler out, see what you know, you know, if, if you're going to go that direction here, because that's a it's a big ask of a team to take a player like that in the first round where, where, you know, if you have him 50th on your big board and you're taking him at 18, because the thought is that you can get his dad also. I think that is, um, I think that's a, probably a little bit of a reach there. There'll be two days uh, for this draft. I guess the NBA is trying to, you know, get more excitement, allow for more trades and intrigue. Do you think we'll, we'll see some effects from, you know, having it split into two days? Yeah, it's interesting because we kind of like, you know, just from doing TV the last seven years of it, we kind of get to the second round and we're like, you know, oh my God, you know, we were like looking at the clock, right? You know, and then you get to midnight and you still got 20 picks left and you probably don't do those players or the teams the the, uh, due service that it it deserves here. So we are, it's kind of a taking a page out of the NFL, um, you know, where round two is is the next day. We we focus really on, on, um, on um you know and Ron Ron on, on that Wednesday here I think it's going to be interesting as far as you know you mentioned earlier you know so how some of these roster restriction rules with the apron and how teams can add to the roster and you know one of those rules is the um, inability to send out cash for these high spending teams and we always see it every year you know the team buying a draft pick for three million dollars and you're going to see it you know a third of the league basically sitting at the kids table Thursday night for when it comes to that aspect here so I do think I think when you give a team or, or all 30 teams another day, so we end Wednesday night and then you have basically a full day till we get to four o'clock on Thursday, I do think you, you there are more options on the table compared to, you know, we're going right from round one to round two and now you got five minutes on the clock, right? And you've got to figure out where you, what you want to do. Just before we go, who's going who's gonna to make a whole lot of noise this off season? Which teams are going to, you know, make the headlines? You know, it's funny. I, I just wrote an article and it's up on ESPN.com. And, um, you know, it's kind of like the sleeper teams, right? Like we always talk about, you know, certainly LeBron in LA and what happens there. And Philadelphia is going to be a storyline because of all that money they have. And they've got Embiid and Tyrese Maxey. And we'll see what happens in Miami with Jimmy Butler. But when you look at like New Orleans, for example, like what happens with Brandon Ingram? What Chicago, you know, can you run back the same group that's lost in the plan? You've got DeRozan and Zach Levine, we got to talk about again. Um, San Antonio is fascinating. You know, certainly when you have a franchise player like Victor, can you accelerate the rebuild? They've got so many draft picks. Um, Portland is another team here. You know, some of these teams in the lottery, like, does the timeline of all these young kids fit with, you know, when you have Jeremy Grant and DeAndre Ayton and Robert Williams and Malcolm Brogdon, all these veteran players here. And then, of course, Utah, right? I mean, Utah, you know, tore down their roster two years ago. They're sitting on a boatload of draft picks here. Um, they are flushed with money to go out and, and spend. Um, so I think, you know, those five teams, which are not headline teams, are kind of like those sleeper teams that can kind of, you know, change a little bit of the landscape this offseason. Yeah, should be fun. Bobby Marks, thanks so much for joining us on the show. I appreciate it. Thank you. That's it for today. Subscribe on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts and leave a rating or a comment while you're there. Thanks for listening. We will see you tomorrow.